so we see we see that there has been an evolution of identity in india so when we go back to the most ancient times and ask what was identity clearly there was no regional we are indians kind of an identity the identity in the earliest times is that about uh, brahman we are one we are our identity we see we seek truth this is a truth seeking civilization what is the nature of reality what is the reality of my existence what is the goal of life these are the quest and identity that most people had eventually with the pramanas we talked about charvakas and others so they were people who were uh, 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 you, you can say astika nastika kind of identities evolved where people with certain pramanas they questioned certain things and rejected shabda pramana rejected certain things so this was the identity that evolved again in very ancient times and there were debates on where people fall this or that there's no clear distinction saying you are this you are that these are 20th century categorizations that led much later much later when the muslims and the arab uh, and the and the arab, abrahamic religions they came about we became the other mm. we became the other because we were everything they were not <laughs> so <laughs> so they Very came true. about with this notion of monotheism this monotheism concept goes back to a very ancient time if you if you go to babylon if you go to uh, if you, if you go to persia uh, with, at that time when the semitic people were living with with these people around, around that time these notions of uh, monotheism came about from a bedrock of uh, polytheism that existed at that time mm-hmm. i'm using uh, uh, modern words these mm-hmm. are not uh, truly applicable in the indian context but still let's use this so monotheism came about in the context of why monotheism if there are already so many divinities or the nature of divinity was seen so it came about with i am better than everybody else they are all false i am better so this kind of exclusivity came to give credibility what we call pramana what is your authority for knowledge are you using shabda pramana are you using logic are you using rationality what are you using in order to claim this divinity status and other such things so in this case it was nothing more than i said so i have a revelation from god or uh, some prophet he came and talked to me or he talked to god mm-hmm. and therefore he said that therefore it is true or there is some supernatural incident that has happened and uh, he rose from the dead and all these kind of things and that is why this is true so these kind of illogical irrational statements coated with a lot of anger in terms of us and them kind of dynamics that came about from abrahamic times and we are seeing evidence of these things in the old testament itself if you go to the old testament we are seeing many of the battles that the yahweh god commanded the semitic people hebrew people were against the vedic people were against yeah. the, the people the canaanites the the hitites and the jebusites and other such people were living we even identified mitannis as one of the people that these biblical people were fighting with and we are seeing the turning away from vedantic ideas in the old testament in the genesis and other accounts itself if you read the account of genesis it is trying to say god created a perfect eden for adam and eve first adam then out of adam's eve in an inferior way he makes eve and then tells them you can do everything except eat of the tree of wisdom wisdom uh-huh. mind you and the snake comes and says do you know if you eat of the tree of wisdom you'll realize you're as powerful as god so this is a vedantic idea where we are mm. all brahman and we realize mm. that through self realization and knowledge that this is the inward journey we go about to realize the nature our true nature so this is rejected in the genesis story where the snake comes and tempts eve eve goes eats this gets some uh, viveka of discrimination and she puts on some clothes or bark or fig leaf or whatever god mm-hmm. comes and asks why are you two hiding over there and he realizes they have disobeyed him and the curse uh-huh. the fall of man humanity starts over there and the original sin starts over there and a whole lot of problems start over there in that tradition so we are seeing that the rejection of vedanta is there in the genesis earliest abrahamic accounts it starts a turning away there are several other stories i can tell you that show where this rejection starts anyway that us and them was violent that us and them monotheism became very violent so they came to india who when we start with uh, biblical people let's leave that that all happened outside india that is fine in northern iraq southern so the the vedic domain shrunk gradually from that very great domain into perhaps you can think afghanistan india this is what oh. was restricted 
But by the time the Islamic people came, we became the kafir, we became the mushrik, we became the idolaters, we became the hated people who had to be killed, destroyed, and those kinds of things, and they became the other. That was our identity. We didn't ask for that identity. It was mm -hmm. forced on us by them. Then going on to the Christian times, the colonialists. So again, we became the other. We became the pagan. We mm -hmm. became the heathen. We became the casteist. We became the Aryan. We became the Dravidian. We became all of these identities which the Europeans thrust on us. We didn't yeah. ask for that. This is thrust on us by them. European colonialism led, came along with ethnocide. Enormous ethnocide also came. I talked about five frameworks that is controlling your mind on history, on what yeah. your history and identity is. But that came hand in hand with the British uh, ethnocide also. Ethnocide, we had five mechanisms, basically. So they, they controlled not only, first of all, poverty. I talked about this. India was a very rich society in the past. In British time, we felt the curve went steeply from approximately 25% of world GDP. We went to less than 4% of world GDP through a sequence of events, not only impoverishment by high taxation, but prevention of Indians from participating in the industrial revolution. Industrialization was forbidden to Indians. India was made a captive market for finished goods from Europe. All these things led unfair trade practice and everything, poverty, we know that. So poverty had the greatest effect of ethnocide, the transformation of a people itself. Second was this conception of caste. This mm. conception of caste was something that Risley and other anthropologists, they came about. They force fit their notion of caste on the Jati Varna system that served the Indian model for a very, very long time. And that caused enormous distortions going hand in hand with this. Third was the missionaries, the Christianization. Christianization led to a destruction of religion in India. All over, they went about on the war path by trying to show India's backward, primitive, uh, Hinduism is the work of Satan and all these kind of works which controlled people's minds. So, so this way with many mechanisms, the other one was the introduction of English. So the introduction of English was the English Education Act. That saw the creation of a class of elites in India, in Bengal especially, and other places, people who looked down upon the vernacular, people who looked down upon the classical languages of India, and they uh, held up the Western model of uh, progress and, and so on. So this is the model. So the introduction of English led to a distancing of Indians further from their past. Works in Sanskrit and Arabic were not funded by the British. Only works in English were to be promoted in printing and other such things. The schools that were formed, the jobs that you would get, everything was geared towards English only. So uh, we had several mechanisms of ethnocide that also had an impact on identity. So, uh, uh, so, 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 so like I said, the five frameworks that control your mind and history and these frameworks of ethnocide that I talked about, all of this has led to deep deracination. Deracination is when the Indian today has got no clue of who he is. You ask the average mm -hmm. person on the road, what are you? <laughs> Scratch that. I'm an Indian. I'm an, yeah, I'm an Indian and I like cricket and I like Bollywood and I salute the flag. That is about it. Nobody can connect to their past. Nobody can say, I am the proud inheritor of this glorious civilization that existed, this knowledge system that existed, because everything has been perverted. People have been kept in a state of ignorance. The ignorance has been forced by these five frameworks, continued today by the Modi administration in addition who's not done a single thing to remove this framework. So we are seeing a continuation of, uh, of, of these policies into present day, keeping Indians in a state of blissful ignorance, deracinated, removed from their context, and in our the Western civilization, chase, chasing a Western model and accelerating downfall of the Indian model. And the bottom line is today, we are seeing the conflict model that has been proposed by the leftists and the Marxists that has been upheld. Everywhere you go, you see the students who are completely ignorant of the ancient Indian models have readily adopted this conflict model. This conflict model is emphasizing a bottom-up narration where everybody is in conflict with everybody else. Why is that? Because that is a Marxist model. Marxist model believes that all of history is a history of class conflicts. Yes. The only yes. history that exists is class conflict. That's according to them. 
And to them, they believe in this utopian fantasy of a classless society, which can come about by the destruction of the old order. And in the West, the old order is whatever they want, uh, the capitalist class and whatever. In India, it is Hinduism. By destroying Hinduism, they believe they can get this uh, classless society, whatever that, that might mean. So this model has been adopted by the socialists, also the Nehruvian socialists who have upheld this, and this is what is happening. So the conflict model, the so-called subaltern voices that is coming, that is trying to say that here is this person's story, that person's story, and these little stories are amplified as reality. Yeah. The bottom, the top-down model is gone. The top-down model is a cohesive identity. The top-down model talks about the Indian civilization, the idealization, the practicalities, what it is, the evidence that we have, the texts that we have, the philosophies that we have, the gurus, acharyas that we have, who have told us these many things, the scientists that we have had. It is a top-down model is cohesive, shows the enormous cultural unity and identity of the Indian civilization. The bottom-up model that has been uh, pushed today is a conflict model, us and them, oppressor oppressed, that is only looking at that person, uh, marginalized this person, that person, the ancestor, put down these people, you're retrogressive, you belong to the cancel culture, you need to be put down. <laughs> so this is the kind of noise, noise is amplified, enormous noise is amplified without the ability to rationally, logically deconstruct any of these uh, uh, bottom-up claims. That yes. is what's happening today. So the identity is a massive casualty over here. It's a casualty of these kind of dynamics. So today, what is the situation that you have? Today, the average Indian, his sacred spaces are under attack. His sacred spaces are not holy anymore. They are all perverted. They're all attacked. His identity is attacked. If you were to wear any identity of a Hindu, you're under attack. Your festivals are under attack. Your uh, uh, beliefs are under attack. Your food is under attack. Every single aspect of your existence, history, everything is under attack by these frameworks, these five frameworks that have led to deracination, that have led to this kind of an amplification of the leftist voice, that has led to this kind of a situation. So in the noise that we are seeing today, the identity issue has got completely submerged into this uh, miasma, uh, uh, very, very uh, pungent odor of this uh, leftism that is coming over here, where we are completely lost sight of who we are as a people. This is the tragedy of where we are. Uh, so much so that even uh, last year, the uh, uh, CEO of a major company, founder of a major company in India, he came on uh, Times of India in an interview saying, Hinduism is the reason for our backwardness. This was a major industry leader who formed a massive software company in India that is well known even today. This man who is a known Marxist comes out with a statement like this saying, Hinduism is the reason we are not progressed for the last 3000 years. So in his thinking, jettison Hinduism for progress. So when thought leaders like this, I hesitate to call him thought leader, mm, exactly. business leader, he, his accomplishment mm. is in business. Yes. Business leaders come and state these kind of things. A lot of unthinking youngsters might be swayed by this kind of thinking. So yes. we have an unfortunate situation where the people who can guide the acharyas, the gurus, and others are in a in a in a uh, they're not fully aware of some of these battlefronts over there. Some thought leaders like Rajiv Malhotra and others have written excellent books and given talks that help us to place some of these conflicts in their place and understand what is going on. But there is great need for the younger generations to understand some of these frameworks, battles on identity, try to deconstruct these claims and try to show the utter hollowness of these things and where our uh, civilization comes from. The, the, the sad reality is the coolness factor is not there. Mm -hmm. So the, the old is seen as retrogressive and the coolness factor is not there. So how do you get the coolness factor? How do you try to show pride in your civilization? How did the Chinese do it? How did the Japanese do it? How did the yes. French do it? How do these people, these civilizations don't even have a fraction of what our ancestors have, but they have glorious narrators of their civilization. The average person has got enormous pride in who they are, who their ancestors were. How do we get that into India? That's something that most of us have to sit and think about. And uh, I, I think the solution is for people to realize they're deracinated, 
break these chains, the shackles that have been put in your mind, break them and get out of it with logic, with rationality, with evidence, mm -hmm. and try to see what is our true narration. So this, this, this is my take on the identity of Divyanshi. Mm -hmm. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.